Hey guys, this is Kerry, and this is going to be Lesson 7 on Encryption. So let's get started. Please try the Do Now problem on your own, and come back in a minute, and we'll go over it. Which of the following best describes a DNS spoofing attack? Alright, so last time we learned about all these cyber attacks. For question number one, someone creates a fake email that appears to come from an authentic source. The email contains a link that redirects you to a website that looks authentic, and asks you to log in with your email and username. Or username and password. Uh... That is not a DNS spoofing attack, but that is something called a phishing attack. Because they're like casting out uh, some bait and seeing if you are silly enough to click the link. Uh, so you get a lot of these in your spam email. All right, a number of computers all simultaneously send numerous requests to the same website server, causing it to shut down. So website servers are designed to handle a lot of requests because a lot of people go to those websites at the same time. But if you start sending so many requests, the website will become overloaded. It's kind of similar to when you feel like you have too much going on in your life, and then you just become so stressed out that you shut down. This is what happens to the website. Um, this is not a DNS spoofing attack. This is something called a DDoS attack, which is a very common kind of security, uh, cybersecurity attack, uh, or cyber attack, where a bunch of computers all try to log onto the same website, and it can't handle the traffic and shuts down. This actually sometimes happens accidentally to websites as well. Like when they get posted on Reddit, sometimes you'll see that a link no longer works. And that's because so many people have tried to see the link at the same time that the web servers just said, eh, I'm not doing it today, and quit their job for the day. For choice three, a virus shuts down a computer and encrypts all of the user data. The malicious programmer who created the virus demands a sum of money to decrypt the data and make it accessible again. So here they're holding your data hostage, and they're demanding a sum of money. That's a ransom. So this is an attack called ransomware. Uh, and so this is not a DNS spoofing attack. A hacker hacks into a DNS server. OK, so before we continue on, let's just think about our picture of the internet, right? We've got our phone. We want to connect to the internet. So we're like, all right, I'm on the internet. Let me go to www.google.com. But google.com isn't called google.com, right? Google.com has some, the web server for that has some internet address, some IP address. So let's say the IP address for Google is like 972, or that's not right, 97.213.14.059 or something. All right, so this is Google's IP address. What we basically need is we need a phone book, a way where we can translate this URL into this IP address. And that's where something called the DNS server comes in handy. And so if a DNS server is working correctly, the DNS server will be like, oh yeah, you want to go to Google? Let me send you to 97.213.14.059. But if you are a hacker, you can actually hack into this computer. And when you hack into that computer, you can say, okay, well, google.com, we're going to map that to the incorrect IP address. We're going to say that when you type in google.com, it should send you to 100.100.100.100. And that will no longer be Google's computer. That might be a hacker's computer. And so then you're on Google's site, you think, but you're actually on this site, and uh, anything you type in is uh, visible by the hacker. So this is something called a DNS spoofing attack because you're changing the entry for Google in the DNS server. All right, so with all of these cyber attacks, phishing, DDoS, ransomware, uh, viruses, DNS spoofing attacks, how do we protect ourselves? So one way we protect ourselves is we use passwords. Let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of this approach. So let's say I can look over your shoulder, and I see that your password is six characters long. I assume I can also see that your password is made up of just letters, and I can see that you never press the shift key, so all the letters are lowercase. How many possible passwords must I try to hack into your account? How long would it take a modern computer to do this? So it looks like there's a part A and a part B. So let's take a look at part A first. So we know that your password has six characters. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we know that it's all letters. And we know that they're all lowercase. So this should start reminding you of this shirt, hat, pants problem where we had to make the tree and figure out how many outfits we could make. 
But instead of choosing a hat, a shirt, and a pair of pants, we're saying you have 26 choices for this character because we know it's letters and we know it's lowercase. 26 for each of them, actually. And to get the total number of possible passwords, the total combinations that I need to try to hack you, so we start with maybe A, 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 and then A, 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 B, A, 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 C. In order to figure out how many total passwords there are, we've got to multiply these all together. And that will give us 26 times itself, six times, so 26 to the sixth power. So let's use that on our computer, 26 to the sixth power. So that is 308,915,776 possible passwords. Which you could imagine, if you were trying to hack somebody, you would not want to type in 309 million passwords. So I'm just going to round it to 309 million passwords. So this seems pretty safe. But computers don't really have this problem, right? Computers have infinite patience because they don't really have a conscience in, in this case. They also don't really have any limitations on how fast they, or they have some limitations on how fast they can try things but they're way less limited in how fast they can try those. So if we wanted to figure out how long it might take a modern computer to try all these passwords, maybe we'll write a JavaScript program, and its job is just to try all these passwords on somebody's Gmail account. Um, let's look up in a piece of information about our computer. So this is gonna be an approximation, um, but that's still useful. So here we are, I'm looking up on my computer and the component of the computer that's most important here is actually the CPU. So the CPU, we learned, is the part of the computer that does all of the calculations. Now, when we say calculations here, it's important to keep in mind that every single thing your computer does is in binary. Whether it's the data that it stores or the commands like to save a file, all of that is binary in the end. So all of that is calculations. So uh, the CPU actually does all of the, maybe a better word would be task for the computer. But those all happen to be calculations. All right. So my CPU on my Mac, my Mac is about eight years old. It has 1.8 gigahertz as the measure of its processor. Now this is probably a meaningless number to you, but what this number means is my computer is actually capable of doing 1 billion, because giga is billion, 800 million, 1 billion, 800 million task per second. And it probably would take more than one task to try each password, but maybe it's a safe assumption to say that just for the sake of estimating, let's say it takes one task to try each password. Um, so that would be 308 million passwords, 308 billion, million passwords, 309 million passwords, this number, divided by the number of tasks we can do per second. So if we do that calculation, uh, let's see, I'm just gonna do an approximation of it. It takes approximately uh, 0 0.16 seconds to do all of these tasks. And that's if we were able to devote our whole processor to doing this, which may not be a realistic uh, estimate. And that's if we were able to do one task per password, which is also not really realistic. But we have like kind of here something that shows that like it's on the order of like a, maybe less than a second to a couple of seconds to try all of these passwords for our computer. So you're going to get hacked really quick. So there are some protections that you're aware of probably, like dual factor authentication, which is when they send your phone a password that you have to type in in addition to your normal password. Uh, you're probably also aware of websites that shut you out after a certain number of tries. And that's so that a computer program like this can't use brute force to try all the passwords. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do you create a password that's actually secure? And so let's look at what happens if we make our password not six letters, but we make it twice as long, so 12. We're still going to have 26 choices for each of these. So that's going to result in 26 to the 12th possible passwords. So doing that calculation, 26 to the 12th, that leaves us with this number right here, 9, 5, 
And then let me count this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this is normals, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. 95 quadrillion. I think that's the right word for it. One second. So thou nothing's thousands, millions, billions, trillion. Yeah, quadrillion. Passwords. Possible? So with a twice as long password, we clearly get some more passwords possible. Instead of 308 million, we're at 95 quadrillion. But let's look at how this changes the time factor issue for our computer. If we do this number, and I don't want to rewrite it all, but if we do this number divided by the number of tasks we can do per second, let's see if we can do that on our computer here. This number divided by 1, 8, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That leaves us with this many seconds. It will take this long in order to do that calculation. Or to try all the passwords. To try all the passwords. But that's kind of hard to interpret, right? It still seems small because it's seconds. If we convert this to hours, let's see what we get. Divided by 60, that will give us minutes. Divided by 60, that will give us hours. Oh, it's still a really big number. Let's divide that into days. Divided by 24 to make it days. All right, uh, so this will be about two years worth of calculations for our computer, which is a huge number of years, right? You don't want to sit at your computer and have it doing just this for two years. So what you can see here is by doubling the length of the password, it did not double the length of the time it took. It made it exponentially longer. And this type of problem is hard for computers to solve. So what you want to do to create a secure password is you want to make a password that's long, so it would take a computer a long time to guess it. Uh, two years is, is nobody's going to want to devote two years to guessing your password so that they can read your email. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about cybersecurity and how we stay safe online. So with the internet, one thing that's really important is to have that picture of the internet that we've been drawing each class. So you take your computer, maybe uh, you connect it to Wi-Fi, so what we know that's a radio wave, uh, and then that connects to something called a router, which is in your house. That router is plugged in with a copper wire to the wall, maybe like Time Warner cable or something set this router up for you. Um, and then once it goes into the wall, following kind of down there, you get into uh, the DNS servers, you translate the IP addresses to the correct websites that you want to go to, it connects you to that web that is fault tolerant and redundant, that net, so that, that internet, so that you can get from one place to another place on the internet in many different ways. And then finally, you would end up maybe at your web server. Let's say it's Amazon.com this time. So we've learned that we're susceptible to being hacked at a variety of places here. Maybe there's somebody who wants to hack you, so they listen for your Wi-Fi waves, uh, and they, they have like a, a receiver that they can, he they can try to read those waves. Maybe there's somebody who hacks into a DNS and does a DNF spooking a spoofing attack. Um, maybe there's somebody who creates a, a little sensor that they hook up to a wire here and they listen on that wire for all the requests that go through that wire. So let's imagine that we're looking at this hack, which is actually very similar to this hack. Somehow you're able to hack into the system and listen for web requests. See, you might think this isn't particularly interesting. You'd hear a bunch of web computers saying, hey, can you get me Amazon.com? Hey, can you get me Google.com? But what's important to remember is that a lot of information is included with these requests. So number one, the IP address for the request is going to be included. So the person who wants it is, is, you know who that is. You know which computer that is. But another thing is, is if you think about Amazon, we actually have to send Amazon secure information like our credit card numbers. So part of the web request, if we're making a purchase online, is we might, these might include credit card numbers.
So if I send a web request that has my credit card number and somebody is listening right here and my request happens to go through that, they can actually read my credit card number off of my request. Unless we do something to protect those credit card numbers. And we talked a little bit about this idea before, which is how do you mask a message to make it secure? So what you can do is you can actually encrypt those messages in a variety of ways. So maybe there's some way that we can take that credit card number and shift all the digits by one or shift all the digits by seven. And then Amazon knows our secret and we know the secret. And so we're able to send it securely. But we're going to talk a little bit about how that actually happens because it's a little bit more complicated and more interesting, to be honest, than, than that. So let's take a look at problem four. We've actually talked about encryption. You wrote a program that encrypted secret messages, or two programs, and one of those messages used something called the Caesar cipher. So I'm going to tell you straight up, this is encrypted using a Caesar cipher with a shift of one to decrypt the secret message. All right, so take a minute to see if you can decrypt it. So because the encryption algorithm, the encryption procedure, was to go forwards one letter, go forwards one letter. We know that the decryption algorithm is going to be to go backwards one letter. And so going backwards one letter, Z becomes Y, so this will be Y. P becomes O, V becomes U. Um, and you can go through this whole thing and decode this message. So this may not seem like a, this, this may seem a little bit secure, right? It looks like gibberish. If I didn't tell you that it was a Caesar cipher and I didn't tell you that the shift was one letter, you'd be probably stuck here for a little while trying to decode it. The problem is, is that computers know what Caesar ciphers are, or hackers know what Caesar ciphers are. And computers are able to try all the different shifts. It's only 26 options, right, for the shift. One letter, two letters, three letters. They can try all of those uh, in, like, a fraction of a fraction of a second. So whatever message you sent would totally not be safe. So instead, we can look at more sophisticated encryption algorithms. So one that's very similar is called the Vigeneer cipher. And it's a more complex cipher. So here's how the Vigeneer cipher works. I'm going to tell you my encryption algorithm, and you can figure out the decryption algorithm on your own. It's like a Caesar cipher, but instead of always doing the same shift, but the shifts are, in this case, I made the shifts plus 4, plus 5, plus 3, plus 4, plus five, plus three, and that just repeats forever. So the first letter will be shifted four forwards, then the next is five forwards, then the next is three forwards. Four forwards, five forwards, three forwards. So four, five, three. Four, five, three. Four, five, three. And you can probably figure out what the decryption algorithm will be based on this. It's just like the opposite, right? And so uh, you can figure this one out, but uh, I'll give you a couple of hints to make sure you're doing it right. The first two words are a computer. Uh, and it's a pretty silly joke, so I think you should actually finish translating this uh, so that you get the entire secret message. But you're just going to go back four, back five, back three, and then repeat this forever. All right, so continuing on, these types of ciphers are actually similar. The Caesar cipher and Vigeneer cipher are examples of something called symmetric encryption. So what symmetric encryption means is the encryption and decryption algorithms
are uh, inverses, they're opposites. Um, and what's key about this is you can figure out the decryption algorithm if you know the encryption algorithm. So if I tell you it's a Caesar cipher going forward seven, you automatically are able to figure out the decryption algorithm. You're like, okay, I know it's a Caesar cipher going backwards seven in order for me to decrypt it. So this is okay, you would think, right? But let's get back to our model of the internet. Let's say I want to send my credit card. And I want to send it to Amazon.com. I have to tell Amazon, hey, when I encrypt my credit card, guys, I'm going to be shifting the digits three units forward each, or three numbers forward. And then Amazon, wait, well, how would I send this message to Amazon? I guess I'd have to send it as part of my request with the credit card number. I'd have to send it as a separate request to Amazon. But we run into that problem, right? If our hacker is listening, they'll hear how I'm encrypting it. And then if they know how I'm encrypting it and they can see the credit card number, then they have all of the pieces that they need to decrypt it. All right, so maybe Amazon just always uses the same message for decrypting things or encrypting things. And then they tell me, oh wait, that's a problem, right? If Amazon has to tell me, hey, this is how we're encrypting it, then that has to go back. And then I'm like, oh, the hacker gets to hear how they're decrypting the message on their end. And so symmetric encryption runs into a bit of a problem. I'd have to find some way to meet up with Amazon, not on the internet, and I mean, email doesn't work, text message doesn't work, that's all on the internet. Um, web requests don't work, going to the website doesn't work, that's all on the internet. I'd have to find some way to meet up with Amazon in secret and say, hey, this is how I'm encrypting my method, or my, my, my credit card number, so they could decrypt it. But that's not really realistic, right? With billions of customers for Amazon, they don't want to keep track of billions of ways of encrypting and decrypting. And also they don't have the ability to meet up with people to learn these ways. So symmetric encryption has a fundamental weakness. It has a fundamental flaw, which is um, we need to share in secret how we're, we need to share in secret how we are encrypting things. Because if it's a symmetric encryption method, if they know how we're encrypting things, then a hacker will always be able to do the inverse and decrypt, decrypt it. So we need to share in secret how we are encrypting things because a hacker who learns how I am encrypting things We'll just do the inverse to decrypt it. And the hacker can actually hear, or I'm using the word here, but can actually see all of those requests because they've hacked into the network. Um, so they can just see uh, all of these, these methods and encrypted things going by. So there is a really revolutionary idea here, which is if there's something called symmetric encryption, then humans have invented something called asymmetric encryption. And this is a genius idea. So asymmetric encryption basically means the tool used to encrypt and the tool used to decrypt are unrelated, are not unrelated, uh, cannot be figured out from each other. So this is a really hard idea to wrap your head around. Basically, I'm going to say, uh, my so I have a secret message, and I want to encrypt it. 
I'm going to encrypt it using some method. And even if you know how I encrypted it, you won't be able to just decrypt it based on that. So the decryption method is totally unrelated. Or appears unrelated. And then that would turn it back into carry. And it's hard to imagine like what type of process, if you, even if you knew the encryption process, it seems like couldn't you just do it backwards and then get the original thing out? But it turns out that we have sophisticated enough calculations uh, using modular arithmetic, the mod operation, that even if you know the forwards process, the backwards process can't be intuited, which is remarkable for internet security. So the type of security that we actually use quite a bit is called public and private key cryptography. So the way that public and private key cryptography works is a couple steps. So let's say we wanted to translate the word carry. We know that in reality, carry is actually just a bunch of ones and zeros on our computer. So it's actually a number. So we can do math to that number to encrypt it. Now, we're not going to get into the specifics of what that math is because it's pretty sophisticated. But what we can do with public and private key cryptography is if I wanted to encrypt carry, I generate two numbers. And they're called a key pair. Generate a key pair. One is called the public key. And one is called the private key. So if I wanted to encrypt this, we could take this group of ones and zeros. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to encrypt it with my private key. And maybe it looks different then. It's a whole bunch of different ones and zeros. But then I can, what I can tell you is I can tell you, uh, here, here is my public key. And if I share with you my public key, you'll be able to, oh, sorry, I'm going to write actually here what the step was. This was encrypt. So if I share with you my public key, the public key is able to decrypt it. And then you get back the original sets of ones and zeros, which can be translated back into carry by using ASCII or whatever. Um, all right. So what's important about this from this stage of understanding to take forward is that even if you know my public key, there's no way for you to figure out what the private key is, what the method was I used to encrypt it. These two methods are asymmetric. Even if you know one of them, you cannot figure out the other one. So this is how messages are actually sent online. Let's say I wanted to send a message to Amazon. There are four keys involved. There is Carrie's private key. There is Carrie's public key. Oh, great. Public key. There's Amazon's private key and Amazon's public key. Now, either key can be used to encrypt the message. So what we do is this. We take our message, and let's say I want to send it to Amazon. The reason why, well, before we get into the specifics here, the reason why these are called public keys is we actually, every user on the internet has a public key, and we share that with, with everyone in the world. We're like, hey, I'm Carrie, and this is my public key. You can use it to decrypt my secret messages, I, and, and I, you can use it to encrypt messages to me. Um, this is my public key. But then we keep the inverse function, the opposite function, the decryption method secret as a private key, and so does Amazon. All right, so here's how it works. Let's say we take a message. I want to send this message to Amazon. 
but I want only Amazon to be able to read it. So what I can do is I can take my message and I know Amazon's public key. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to encrypt using Amazon's public key. And then even if a hacker gets it, they're like, they know the public key, but the public key doesn't decode it. They have to know the private key to decode it because the private key is paired with the public key. And the only person who knows Amazon's private key is Amazon. So then Amazon gets my message and they're able to decode it using decrypt it using uh, Amazon's private key, which only they know. And they get the message back. So as long as they keep their private keys secret, anything that's locked with the public key can only be unlocked with the private key, can only be decoded, decrypted with the private key. And, uh, and Amazon is the only one who knows that. So everyone knows this, so they all know how to encrypt it for Amazon, but only Amazon knows how to decrypt it, and thus the message is safe. But we can actually take this one step further. Uh, I wish that I had given you some more room here. So uh, I'm, gonna erase, I'm gonna put this at the top here. So I wanna show you all of the steps actually, because this is there's one step more important here. So let's say I wanna take a message. I wanna send it so that only Amazon can read it. So I'm gonna lock it with Amazon's private key, or public key because I don't have access to their private key. Oops. Uh, so let's see. Encrypt with Amazon's private public key. So this method, method guarantees that the only person who can read it is Amazon, because uh, Amazon is the only one that knows the private key, which decrypts this. All right. Now, we're actually going to take one more step, and we're going to encrypt it one more time. So let's encrypt the message now with my private key. So we're double encrypting it. And you might wonder, why are we going to encrypt this with Carrie's private key? Well, when Amazon gets it, what they're going to do is they're going to do two things. To decrypt it, they know that it's been encrypted with these two things. So they can do this one first. So they're going to decrypt it. But how do you decrypt Carrie's private key? You use Carrie's public key. And everyone has access to Carrie's public key. So this isn't a security feature. It's actually a way for Amazon to verify that this message actually came from Carrie. Because if they're able to decrypt it with Carrie's public key, then that means it must have been encrypted with Carrie's private key, which means it must have come from Carrie because that's his, his secret key that he doesn't share with anyone. Now, they're going to decrypt it a second time now with their private key. And what this is, this is the security, right? They're the only ones who can read something that's been encrypted with the public key because they're the only one that has the private key. So then they do that, and then they finally get the message. So the benefit of having this system is twofold. They're able to read these messages in secret because they're the only ones who can decode things that have been locked with their public key. But they also have, ben they also have exact knowledge that it was sent from Carrie because by using Carrie's public key to decode it, they know that it was locked with Carrie's private key, which means that it must have come from Carrie. So you, you know who sent the message, and you know that you're the only one who can read the message. So this message is super secure now. Now this took me a long time to wrap my head around, so I'm going to include another video that shares the same information from a different resource than Carrie. And I hope that you'll find that helpful in understanding it. I really recommend watching it. I think this is one of the most genius inventions of our time and one that we use on a daily basis whenever we send private information on the internet, whether those are uh, encrypted text messages through uh, WhatsApp or credit card numbers to buy things. We use these methods on a daily basis. So I hope you've learned a lot from this, um, but if it's a little uncertain in your mind, that's okay. I've watched this video that I'm gonna share like 10 times to understand it. There are four checkpoint problems to so see if you can understand them and uh, send in your answers when you're done. Bye guys.